This episode of Engineering the Future is brought to you by The Personal, Osby's home and auto insurance partner. These past few months have shown us just how important it is to have someone in your corner. When it comes to home and auto insurance, The Personal can be that someone. If you would like to learn more about this exclusive program, visit thepersonal.com slash Osby. This podcast is brought to you by Osby the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the advocacy body for professional engineers and the engineering community in Ontario. Welcome to Engineering the Future, a podcast by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I am your host, Jerome James. Today I'm joined by Mark Frain, a professional engineer and president of Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, and David Brown, professional engineer and past president of Professional Engineers Ontario. Mark, David, and I, along with several other veteran engineers and OSPE members, are part of a reinstated Professional Engineers Act working group at OSPE. We recently completed a submission for the Ontario's Attorney General containing recommendations regarding changes to the Professional Engineers Act. Today, we're going to talk about that submission and the need for regulatory reform in Ontario more generally. To start, Mark, can you explain what the Professional Engineers Act is and why OSPE is recommending changes to this legislation? I'd be happy to, Jerome. The Professional Engineers of Ontario, or PEO, are the regulatory body for the practice of professional engineers in this province. It's basically established under the Professional Engineers Act, which is legislation that falls under the responsibility of the Attorney General. The Act grants the engineering profession the privilege and power of self-regulation and was last revisited in 2017 when it was revised to incorporate uh, recommendations, not all of them, from the Elliott Lake Mall Inquiry. However, the 2017 revisions did not include any recommendations that arose from the 2019 coroner's inquest into the death of Scott Johnson as a result of the Downsview Park Radiohead concert stage collapse. While matters such as these and other changes have been made through regulation, other issues have not been adequately addressed in more than 20 years. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, I, I do want to ask uh, you a question, David, uh, pr- particularly uh, within the role of the PEO. Um, uh, Professional Engineers Ontario is currently undergoing a governance uh, review and changes based on recommendations from an external regulatory review report um, conducted by the uh, Professional Standards Authority in 2019. Uh, you were president at the time and uh, uh, were taking uh, part and uh, making that review happen. Uh, can you tell us more about your role and why you believe that the regulatory review was necessary? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, I guess originally in 2013 when I joined the Board of Professional Engineers Ontario, I went there as a practicing engineer and I and I I was really taken aback by what I felt uh, personally as a practicing engineer, a certain level of dysfunction uh, at the board's operation. And so as I went there in 2013, I started on that board. I worked my way up to the ranks and eventually running for president. And my sole purpose in running that president that year was that we would do a full governance review of PEO, which was long overdue. There had been previous versions of that done a number of years ago and about 20 years ago, I think in the early 90s. But in each and every case, the board at the time felt they knew better and simply shelved it and they collected dust. So my sole purpose of running for president was to try and convince this board to do a full governance review and really assess our role in protecting the public interest in Ontario. So I intended to do that. However, um, the board at the time that I was attempting to do this in 2018 
um, had a number of individuals on it that were, shall we say, hard against any governance. Even the word governance being mentioned was an issue. So what I had to do was find the path of least resistance with that board at that time. And what I was able to convince them to do and barely, barely passed a motion, was to do a, a performance, regulatory performance review, which was carried out by Professional Standards Authority out of England. Well, not out of England, but a gentleman by the name of Sir Harry Caton. And uh, Harry Caton right. was able to conduct this for us during the term of my presidency and then finalize the report in the early spring. This is something that PEO needed to have happen at the time and continues to need. And right now, as part of your question, they're going through a governance roadmap, um, which is a two-year, four-phase uh, project, two-year project, four phases. And they're pretty much finished about the third phase of that now. And this year, what they're looking at, and this is going to be the real uh, difficult portion for the new president, who is a, who is a wonderful gentleman, and I, I encourage him to continue trying to fight this uphill battle, but it's to look at council composition. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, what was the initial uh, reflection by council uh, with the results of this report? Well, one of the things that I wanted to make sure when I was president happened, which I mentioned to you has happened in other, other times this has been done, is that it gets shelved. Mm -hmm. Council receives it, and then it gets put on a shelf somewhere to collect dust up on the sixth floor. What I wanted to make sure happened with this is because we had somebody <clears throat> who is world-renowned regulatory governance expert, Sir Harry Caton, Having them do this, I wanted to make sure it didn't get shelved. So part of the agreement was to do this performance review is that it would have to be, once it was received by council, made public. And it was in June of 18, I believe. Council agreed to do that after much discussion. Okay, interesting. Uh, back to you, Mark. Uh, in your view, what changes to the act are most crucial? There, that's an easy answer, is mandatory continuing professional adult development um, and ensuring that PO's sole focus is regulation. That both of these are incredibly important. Um, a lot of engineers don't realize, but Ontario is the last jurisdiction in Canada to require mandatory CPD. In addition, the dragging of our the heels, I guess you would say, has actually jeopardized our position internationally in terms of recognizing our professional engineering accreditations um, throughout the world. The other thing I have to say is it's been so important to OSPE that not just myself, but probably the the past 10 years, if not longer, the presidents and the board of directors have been advocating for mandatory CPD for engineers. It's becoming so important that we believe this will allow PO to always make the, the decisions in public interest, which do not require the approval of the license holders. Right. Mm -hmm. Our society, yeah. Uh, and you're saying that society would benefit from that. Uh, do you see uh, your industry benefiting from engineers with uh, mandatory CPD? Absolutely. Mining is no different than any other industry right now. The introduction of emerging disciplines and micro technologies are they continue to evolve at a very quick pace and professional engineers need the a new set of skills to improve public safety software engineering is a good example is everybody's car has software in it and if that software isn't designed properly then you could be driving down the 401 and all of a sudden you lose your braking system or something. And so it's very important that not only do we safeguard the public, we need to safeguard the environment. And engineers with our 
ability to solve problems and our analytical skills should thrive in this new knowledge economy, but we need to continue to develop our knowledge base. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly 100% agree with you on that point. Uh, David, in your view, uh, what, step, what steps, concrete steps, are required for real reform at the PEO? Well, um, it's, uh, that's a two-edged sword, uh, Jerome. There's, uh, in, in my opinion, over the years of being there, um, the, the, the governance step that I wanted to make as president, the reason I wanted to make it is because it's very difficult to work with a board that really, for the most part, some of them do, don't get me wrong, there's a number of them that do really understand governance structures on a regulatory body. However, many of them don't. And the, and the real problem with, uh, with the board members, a lot of the board members there, is there, is there two um, association-minded, if I can say it that way. They are concerned with the best interests of the members of the club, if you will, as opposed to the public interest. And it's something that myself and, and a number of other councillors, in fact, in fact um, I'm much more pleased of recent years seeing the council as starting to understand their role in that, in that side. But when I, to answer your question, I would say it's twofold. One at a low level, you have to look at things like diversifying yourself from chapters, which, you know, is, in other words, getting rid of the association interests which comes back to part of the working group that Mark and I are working on. And one of the things is one of the mainstay issues or one of the mainstay aspects of our act that has been relied upon for years to do these association aspects is uh, 244 of the act, which is kind of a catch-all clause. And it doesn't refer specifically to regulatory uh, work. And PO over the years has been able to diversify what they do. In fact, a large majority of their budget every year isn't regulatory, it's association work and you know, looking after the chapters, et cetera. But I think that's some of the ones that are doing and they have to look at rebuilding the licensing system from the ground up. And it, it, it is in total disarray and uh, the current registrar is doing his level best with that, but it's a very large project. However, on the high level side, what I'm looking at, is things that I look at as being nearly impossible for the current board composition to do, and which are, uh, if you look at recent uh, governance reviews done by other regulators, and not on Ontario, but Canada-wide, the high-level reform that a board has to look at doing deals with reducing its board size. PO, as you know, has up to 29 members under the Act allowed to be on that board. And it really, and nowadays, modern boards are 14 to 16. We need to look at a composition. Again, this is all stuff, right. I'm not reinventing the wheel here. This is stuff that, that other regulators have already recognized. And in fact, Harry Caton has confirmed that this is more modern regulation. Changing the composition to 50-50, elected to appointed, where the majority of the appointed are, uh, sorry, the majority of the elected are, are, are elected based on a functional nominations committee. PO under regulations has a nomination committee it just doesn't do its job. It's, it's, it's whitewash. And they really look, need to have a nominations process that's skill-based. And the last thing they really need to do inside of it, which normal boards do, is electing their government, or sorry, electing their president and chair from within the board members. Whereas PEO, as you know, it's a big thing each year, who's going to get right. elected as president. And usually, you know, you have a president, mm -hmm. as case in point, is going to be next year, a fine gentleman, but he hasn't been on the board in three or four years. So it's very hard to walk in and say you're going to be in charge and the president and the face of PEO and the chair of the board, and you haven't even been there for three years. And that is just right, wrong right. in so many levels I can't get out. So these things are type of things that I think to do at the high level. Now, the problem is, is that the board, that the board and, and I think for the most part, although they have improved, most of the board is unlikely to vote themselves off the island. And so the only way I see, as part of your question, is the only way I see to have real reform there is likely going to involve being put under trusteeship by the Attorney General's office, our boss. Wow. And that is the only way I can see that they can push that mm -hmm. rope and get them to do that in a, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time. You remember, Jerome, 
I, I was able to, by the skin of my teeth, have this performance review done in 2017, 18. Well, it's 2021. And if you add up of those 15 recommendations Mr. Caton put out there, very few of them have even been touched. And so that's kind of a typical scenario we see at PO. So it's a it's a tough it's a tough road. Um, I have a it's gotta be done. Yeah. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. At OSPI, we're here for you, making sure government, media, and the public are listening to the voice of engineers. You can learn more at ospi.on.ca. And just a quick follow-up to to all those um, recommendations or um, of getting things moving forward. Uh, did you get a sense of what your average Ontario engineer felt about what was going on? Um, are, is there an appetite for change um, at the yeah. average engineer level um, within the community? Um, are they aware of these issues that are happening at the regulator? Um, uh, absolutely. What, what kind of conversations were you having? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, I hate to say the, the, the cliche, good question, Jerome, but it is. Um, when I was running for president, one of the most startling things I found was that engineers, and I knew they were practicing engineers because of their age and how they chatted with me about where they worked and what they did. But what they asked me, they said, how can you help make our license relevant? They were looking for relevancy. All of us, you know, I'm a practicing engineer. I always wanted to have, be able to be in a room with doctors and lawyers and be, you know, close to being equal. But I'm 50 years ago, we were. But we're so watered down now because of the way our regulation, because of the way people are licensed without having, like our license is just too cheap. When I have friends that are real estate agents with P engines, they've had P engines for 35 years. And I said, why do you keep your license? And the, and the answer every time is, it's cheap. So when I look at that, you have a good question there, is that I, my feeling is people who practice engineering and, and by, by equation, members of OSPI, who I would argue mostly are practicing engineers, members of OSPI, um, we want real reform at PEO. We want to see them do their job and we want to gain relevancy of our license. And all of those things can happen when we stop when, when we get them to stop being worried about what the members think and more about what the public thinks. After all, that's our job. Exactly. Great. Yeah, it makes sense. We want to feel that um, our profession is, is valid and, and still growing and relevant in the 21st century. Um, especially and for, seeing the, that especially there's a future. for the young engineers, Ron. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, Mark, Yes. what's the next step for the Engineering Working Group? Well, the Engineers Act Working Group. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to continue on with something that David said that uh, I, I hold near and dear. Um, before I answer that question, it's the revel relevancy of our, our profession more and more People consider engineers, just civil engineers, designing roads and bridges and buildings. But more and more engineers are getting involved in the short term, uh, short form is called ESG, which is environmental, social and governance part of building things and building companies and building communities. And that's something that isn't really recognized by the PEO, but we are as involved in hard infrastructure as we are in soft infrastructure and more and more engineers are getting involved in the soft infrastructure and we need to develop those skills as well. So what, what are we doing um, in this working group? Well, first of all, we want to continue and support the PEO as it strives to achieve the outcomes it's outlined in its transformation plan. We support the positive changes, but at the same time, we want to give them nudges once in a while to make sure that they continue on a path that is 
is beneficial to our profession and at a pace that is beneficial to our profession. There are expectations internationally and across our nation that Ontario needs to get our house in order in terms of professional engineering. So what is the next steps is we have worked through the group that looking at the uh, PEA, the Professional Engineering Act, and put together a series of recommendations for changes. We're actually looking at two phases. The first phase is in terms of changes to the regulation um, or the act that can immediately take into effect and help the PEO through the transformation and make our profession stronger. The other one, the second phase is looking more at um, changes that will really improve our profession and how we regulate our profession going into the future. So we're hoping right, right. that um, more importantly on that is OSPI is going through a strategic uh, plan exercise right now and contributions from our members and even outside our membership, right from a uh, engineering intern to a retired engineer to a midlife engineer with a young family and a mortgage to an experienced engineer who wants to become, start their own consulting firm. We yeah. need to hear from these individuals so we can make sure that how we move OSPI forward and how we uh, engage the PO to change the Engineering Act is, is for the benefit of our profession. Absolutely, and Mark, how confident is P or is OSPI uh, on getting some of these recommendations adopted? Um, are we are we confident? I, I am very confident because, as I said earlier, it's not just internal pressures. There's external pressures that are being applied to the PEO and to to our uh, the Ontario government to improve how the profession is regulated. Um, and these changes are by default going to make the professional engineers more relevant to society. It's the one thing we have been is we've been very quiet publicly tooting our own horn. Um, but as, as the OSPI president and chair, it's, this is something that I've started to work on through social network and just interacting with individuals, explaining to how important and how ingrained professional engineers are in our society. Excellent. And uh, just one last question for you, David. Um, what are other changes uh, that will be required uh, in the way of practicing professional engineering uh, in Ontario going forward. Uh, are there any other models in other provinces that we can learn from and adopt here in Ontario? Um, there, there are most models in Canada. I also sat on the Board of Engineers Canada. So most of the regulatory models in Canada are very similar. Our acts vary from province to province in small ways and some significant ways. One of the main things that I look at in our act, and as Mark noted at the very start of this broadcast, is, is that our act has had very few changes in very many, in, in, a, in a number of years. Right. It's fact, they remained unchanged for a long time. Um, of course, as anybody looking at this or watching this is going to recognize is that that sounds very dinosaur-like. So we really need to look at how can we update this in keeping with uh, modern engineering and technology advancements that are frankly growing exponentially in recent years. 
And that's something PEL really hasn't talked about. In fact, one of the major issues I wanted everybody to start talking about at the Engineers Canada level was artificial intelligence and how that influences whether or not there is somebody who's actually an engineer or is it, or is it the software that has done the engineering. So looking at going forward from a regulatory point of view, I think most of the models are similar, but one of the main things I would like to see PEO address or look at, and BC recently did, I'm sure you heard of the recent changes in the regulator of regulators uh, model that they have in BC. Right. But what they did look at is the definition of engineering within our act, or in their act they did, but back when our act was written, there wasn't, you know, engineers were really, you know, five or six main types of engineering, civil being one of them, mechanical, electrical, etc. But nowadays, that is not the case at all. In fact, we're only a small portion of the engineering. Engineering, as it's defined in our act, is being carried out. So PEO and the government of Ontario, in, in respecting the interests of the public and safety, really need to look at the definition of engineering in our act and assess whether or not it fits to something that we as a regulator would be capable of performing. At this juncture, I would strongly argue we can't. The current definition is far too broad and far too deep, and it encompasses far too many things that PEO is not regulating at all. However, the public thinks that we are, and that scares the hell out of me at, when I was president because we need to sit down and have an honest conversation with the Attorney General's office, the government of Ontario, our boss, and we need to say times are changing and, and engineering has become way broader than what we're looking at here and we can't regulate it. Right now, PO essentially regulates engineering that is basically defined under other legislation, which, which is called demand side legislation. For instance, I'm a structural engineer and I have demand side legislation that requires a building code act in Ontario, the Ontario Building Code, mm -hmm. that, that I have to be an engineer to design a right. building. Well, we don't have a lot of that legislation. We're getting more, but we don't have much. But right now, there is a huge hole. And then one thing that Mark touched on, too, is that in Ontario, we're the only, the only um, regulatory engineering body in Canada that has an industrial exception. So there's engineering carried on in cars that we can't regulate because they have an exception. We tried to have that removed a number of years ago, I think in 2013, uh, but the government of the day decided to uh, pull that off the table, even, that, even though it had went to third reading. So politics at its best. Um, any rate, that's kind of, you know, I, I apologize for the long answer there, but I, but I really see if we really looked at addressing our definition in the act, I think that would be a good starting point to help us with the upcoming changes we're going to have to make in the public interest. Great. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, uh, David and Mark. Uh, these are serious uh, issues that our profession has to deal with uh, right now, currently, uh, this day and age. Uh, we definitely don't want to put shelve this for another generation and, uh, and uh, find that we wake up one day and uh, engineering in Ontario is, is um, an un, uh, perf <laughs> a profession that's outside of the, the purview of the professional engineer. And uh, I feel like if we act now, we can definitely turn things around and, and have pride in, in the profession of engineering Ontario again. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the both of you. And if anyone is uh, listening that is an OSPE member or otherwise and has input on this discussion or has a suggestion uh, regarding the changes to the Professional Engineers Act, uh, please reach out to OSPE at uh, advocacy at ospe.on.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Mark Frain is a professional engineer and president of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. David Brown is a professional engineer and past president of Professional Engineers Ontario. My name is Jerome James. This has been Engineering the Future. Thank you for listening. From all of us at OSPE, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, thanks for listening. 
please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode.